Please turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 10. Gospel of Matthew chapter 10. And we shall consider verses 1 to 8, which we began studying some time ago, and uh, we will continue that today. And may the Lord grant us the grace to learn all those quickly. Um, today, we will continue with our thoughts on the disciples, the twelve whom God called uh, to be um, the followers of Christ and to take the gospel to the ends of the world. I have made some general statements about them and today and God willing uh, one more uh, I want to say two more because I'm not sure whether I can finish it in uh, this week and next week uh, we will look at individuals uh, in this series uh, so please pray for me they, some characters like Peter, James and John uh, we have a great deal of details how they lived and how they served. But some others, we have very little from the scriptures. So uh, other kind of information that we get from historical records or church history uh, cannot carry the same weight of authority as the scripture has. So I will not go into too much of historical or traditional stories about the apostles. I try to stick as much as possible with the scripture. So... Those who come after the first four, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, uh, will have lesser content. And so I'm hoping we can finish it in two weeks. Now, as we look at the sending out of the disciples that occurs in chapter 10, we see that we can develop some wonderful principles for our spiritual pursuit after Christ and our service for Him. And I'm going to say certain things. I may not be so organized in putting them in forms of points and all that. I hope you pick them up as we, as I comment along the way. <clears throat> From verses 2 to Verse 4, you have the list of the 12 apostles. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius, who was also known as Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. And in verse 5 of chapter 10, you read, These 12 Jesus sent forth. And that's where we see that they were commissioned for a special purpose. There were many disciples. There were many followers of Christ. Many who were learners. They wanted to learn, and they were keen to learn from Christ. But only 12 were specially chosen by Christ to represent Him in an authoritative way as they go forward. Verse 6 says, the, what Jesus told these twelve. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So they were sent at this time, not to the rest of the world, that would happen later, but now to the nation of Israel. And he called Israel a lost sheep. Now that's not something Israelites would cherish. He, no matter how lost they are, they are going to say, no, we are God's dear people. Yeah, that's true. God loves you, but do you love the Lord? They will say, yeah, of course. Because God loves us. Naturally, we love him. That's not how the Lord Jesus sees. They were in terrible shape. They were like sheep that have gone astray. Lost sheep. That was Jesus' name for Israel at his time. They had the temple. They had the priesthood. They had all the posh and pomp and the pageantry of the religion. And everybody was gathering in a very prideful manner. 
But Jesus looked at them, look, and he looked at them with such pity and he said, Oh, how pathetic! What a pity! They are completely lost. You may be thinking that you are pretty good. You know, I'm doing well. I'm studying well, I'm quite clever, I'm healthy, I'm doing well in my business. Well, not bad, I look good, right? I don't know how many of you looked into the mirror before you left home. Surely everybody did, right? Otherwise you would look very miserable. But how many of you felt very happy about yourself when you look into the mirror? Oh, look, I'm looking good, all right. Well, how many of you look in the mirror and say how miserable I am? What a pity. I'm going to church. Oh Lord, I'm full of sin. Please find me. Please help me to find you. Did you come with a very satisfied and contented and self self uh, satisfactory thinking about yourself? Or did you come like a beggar? Well, one of the things that Preachers are told, like Jesus said to the disciples, you can't expect, no matter who comes into the congregation, for them to behave like shepherds. The church is the flock. Of course, I'm also a sheep, but the Lord calls me to represent him. He's not here physically to administer his rule over you. So God chooses some, then the apostles, and now the elders and pastors. And they are called shepherds. And when they go out to minister his word, they must always remember they stand on behalf of Christ to this people. And they must utter the voice of the real shepherd so the lost sheep will hear it. Christ is the Messiah of Israel. Christ is God's promised Savior and King of Israel. He's the joy of Israel. He's the hope of Israel. He's the Prince. And that they didn't see him, they were lost. They couldn't recognize him. They crucified him, right? So Jesus said to the disciples, I've been here preaching to this people for three and a half years. Basically, that's the message. Now, they're not going to bow down and worship me. They should. So even after I go, you must start preaching. In fact, we know later on Jesus would tell them, just before he ascended, that the disciples shouldn't leave Jerusalem. They should wait and pray. And then he said in Acts 1.8, when the Holy Spirit will come, they will be empowered to be witnesses. First where? Jerusalem. Then in Judea. And then in Samaria, still within the boundaries of Israel. And then to the uttermost part of the earth. And so the Lord's greatest desire was to bring Israel back to his fold. It still remains. And it also tells us the principle by which every one who is called to preach and teach should function. The elders and pastors, preachers and missionaries, they better know they are sent out to win a lost sheep. It's terrible if pastors and elders and preachers look like lost sheep. Can you imagine that? (laughs) And worse still, if some of them are grievous wolves, ravening wolves, to destroy the sheep. And... The Bible actually warns us that there will be false teachers and false preachers, money-minded, greedy, filthy, lucre people coming. And also, those are, some of them are sensual, carnal people. They are worldly. They come up with all kinds of ideas, right? Crossover project. Get the church to cross over to the world and you see the way the pastor's wife dance and the pastor says, good, China wine. These are number one historical people. Why did I say historical? They are drunk with the wine of the world. It's too poor of the world. And they bring it to the church. Jesus hates this. 
the filthiness of the world. And so we are a confused lot. Not only the sheep is lost, but shepherds are lost. Can you imagine that? This is horrible. May God speak to every preacher and every elder and those whom God would call in the future to serve him in various leadership of the church today. And let you have this burden. Lord, I cannot be a lost sheep. Neither can I be a disinterested shepherd. I have an assignment from the King of Heaven who came down to this world to redeem his people with his life. And him I represent today. When I stand up and speak, when I sit down and have fellowship with people, when I move about to declare his name, may I be the voice of Christ. Every man should pray that way. And that's the assignment we have. And nothing less than that. It's a high calling. It's a very high calling. For the assignment is from heaven. To prepare a people for heaven. And his manifesto is heavenly. And the prayer and aspiration is this. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It's not good enough for Gethsemane BP Church to look like just another organization in Singapore. Gethsemane BB Church must function like God's kingdom in heaven. We, by the grace of God, is heaven on earth. Do you get it? With all the ordeals we go through, through our needs, through our problems, through hostilities, through difficulties, through our shortcomings, we live up to, by His grace, to a great calling that no man can ever utter into your ears. Follow me, said Jesus to every preacher. I will make you fishers of men. Our duty is to fish people out of their drowning experience in this miserable sea of sin and bring them up and help them to plant their feet upon the rock which is Jesus Christ. May the Lord use us to call his sheep that are still lost out there and give them that redeeming, restoring, renewing, recharging, rejuvenating, reviving voice of the Lord. Most powerful. Nothing like this. Sometimes I pray, especially in these days, Lord, I've been preaching for 20 over years, 25 over years. How many people have heard me over the past decade or more have really turned to Christ, has really found the joy and the power that is in Christ? I don't know, Lord. I still feel many are lost in the world. They do come to church. I mean, the Jews used to go to the temple, you know. They kept all the feast. They kept Sabbath. They were meticulous in the Pharisaic law. Whether to walk a certain distance on Sunday or not. They went to that extent, of course, in a misguided way. But they thought they are religious. I'm very afraid that you feel religious a great deal by coming to church. And at a lost sheep. And I pray that preachers and elders and pastors would see this sight as Jesus saw. And go and live. As a father, I have to do that in my house. My children grasp the vision of the world very easily because it's drummed into them day and night. Everywhere, you know. Even parents, after a while, once they start to 
you know, once children start schooling, will have little time with their children. Very little time. Most of the time, you abandon your kids to the rest of the world. You, they go to school, uh, they, they interact with their friends, and if you have non-Christian relatives and, you know, friends, then they will be with them. So many things trying to take the hearts away. You have a few hours, a few minutes of effort. What is that? Versus... Such a huge influence from the world. Every time when children come back home, I fear in my heart. Lord, what did they bring? They might despise me. I don't know. They still call me daddy. They still come and show respect. But who knows what's in their heart? My daddy, a oh, preacher, what's a big deal, you know? What does he make? How much does he get? What a big deal. Well, they have never said that to me. I praise God for that. But who knows what is shaping the thinking? Now it's time for them to express their thoughts. They are getting into adults. Getting into adulthood. And I have very little control anymore. Now they will express what they have made up in the mind concerning living as a Christian and serving Christ. And so I go into my house, even though my children are taller than me, believing that, Lord, I am the shepherd that you have appointed in this house. If not, if I don't hold on to you, if I am not rejoicing in you, if I am not praising you, if I am not totally given to you, my children would not ever have an opportunity to see it's worth living for Christ. And so I move from place to place, whether I go to our care ministry to preach, or Forreston Bible College to teach students there, or I go from place to place to teach and visit and talk to people or sit in church resource center and prepare my sermon. My prayer is this, Lord, I know my calling is to lead your sheep that have wandered away back to your fold and rejoice in your goodness. That is joyful because I know I'm not alone because the Lord is with me. And he will help me. But it is a huge task. A very solemn and a high calling. And this is what every preacher, every elder, everyone who is called to take spiritual responsibility in whatever position you might be, must be filled with. And that's what... I want you to understand about the purpose of God's call to serve. Represent him in the midst of a people who can easily go astray. And the Lord doesn't choose perfect people to do this work. He picks up people who have been rough and rugged, people who have been not always seen at the highest pedestal of society. The Lord is a master craftsman when it comes to shaping and molding and using his servants. And that's what we are going to see. The twelve, as I mentioned last week, can be seen in three groups, each consisting of four of them. By the way, last week I think uh, I made a mistake when I said the Lord took uh, four of them to the Transfiguration Mount. Actually, it should be three. Somehow when I was talking of the first group, four of them, uh, I, I, in a quick way, made that mistake. And uh, I tried to edit the 
video that we put it up, but it's quite difficult. I think it looks jerk, but never mind. I made that mistake anyway. It's, it, the Lord only took three to the Transfiguration Mount of the four in the first group. However, let me continue with that a little bit so you can remember and put things in perspective. Um, uh, there are altogether four lists of the apostles whom Jesus called in the New Testament. One in Matthew, one in Mark, one in Luke, and one in the book of Acts. In all four lists, you will see these three uh, groups with the same four names in each group. The order of names may be uh, up and down a bit. However, you will see these four in each of those three groups. Though not all might um, agree to what I'm going to say, I do think that um, the, the list is depictive of their intimacy with the Lord. It somehow shows how these people yielded themselves to Christ because we know it starts with Peter and ends with Judas Iscariot. The last in the list is the most distance from Christ, who was a betrayer of Christ. And the first four is what is often known as the inner circle of the disciples of Christ. Namely, Peter and his brother Andrew, James and John. And they were the inner circle people, those who were closer to Christ, whom Christ would call. I'm not suggesting that others didn't love Christ. I certainly believe they love Christ. But interesting enough, if you notice lives of people mentioned in the Bible and people around us today, you will see among believers there are varying degrees of affection toward Christ. Isn't that true? And take more. You know, we, among the congregation, normally churches are advised by the Bible to pick most devout people to the leadership. And so you look at the elders, group of elders. There also, if you, your eyes are open, you will see a varying degree of affection toward Christ, which is expressed in their conduct, their involvement, and their attitude. It's very obvious. Only a blind person would miss this uh, in my thinking. It's almost like in a family, you know, you got four children or five children or whatever number. And you see, some are closer. Not because you want to show favoritism or you show favoritism. Some can live a thousand miles away, but they express their love for you as though they are living next door or same room with you. Some can be living in the same house with you, but they live as though they are 20,000 miles away from you or light years away from you. <laughs> That's how they're all your children, after all. And this disciple seemed to have certain degree of distance in their adherence to Christ. It shouldn't be the case, but that seemed to be clear. Now consider these things that I'm going to quickly mention. The first group was made up of Peter, his brother Andrew, James and John. I said it several times now. Now, they are always grouped together as the first four in the biblical list of the apostles of Christ. And they seem to be moving together. Even though the twelve are together, they seem to be sticking together most of the time. Let me just give you an example. Uh, in Mark chapter 13, verse 3, uh, of course you will see another occasion before that, but let me just point out because of the lack of time, just one. Mark 13 verse 3 states this, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, this is coming toward the end of Christ's ministry, Peter 
James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled. Did you notice? It's very carefully mentioned. They came privately. No other disciples. Just these four. They were very close to Christ. Interesting, isn't it? The least to say. I'm intrigued by this. I always desire and pray that the Lord will give me good co laborers. Thank God all my co laborers thus far are good. Even those who turn against me now and then. They were also nice, with, nice toward me when they were with me until they started developing all the nonsense in their own life. In fact, nobody has, uh, you know, sort of uh, dissented against my leadership by God's grace up to this point. But if anybody has had an issue with me, it's because they themselves sinned against the Lord or they failed in some areas. And I had to stand up and defend the glory of Christ. And for that, they were upset that I didn't give them leeway. No leeway in the leadership. You know that better than anybody else. Neither do I get that and I should be warning myself all the time whenever there is a tendency to wander away from Christ. We are not perfect people, but we have to be responsible. So I often pray, Lord, I want collaborators who understand the glory of the ministry and will have an undying passion for the Lord's work. You know, it's horrible to have a group of people who will not move. You know, you cannot, cannot give jobs to a dead body, can you? I mean, you want to do things and if you are surrounded by corpses, <laughs> cannot move. It, it is the worst scenario you can ever have as a leader. So I pray that the Lord would always keep those who work with me for the kingdom's sake will be at their very best. Now I also pray that there will be men who would see the burdens and get close and help me to achieve that. Because many things I cannot do on my own. Even yesterday I was giving a lecture to my children about, you know, how things ought to be in our church, even from their side. Not that I want them to inherit something I have prepared for them, not that way. But I was telling them, our church is in such a wonderful situation that anybody who has a love for Christ has everything almost ready for them to take on. Those who want to sing, and who want to sing to the Lord's glory, there is a web radio, there is a recording facility. Those who want to, uh, you know, use their technological knowledge, know-how, we are there, right there, just come, it will be. I've been encouraging all the mu musically Talented people, young people, come on, start playing. Now I'm asking them to play during Tuesday night prayer meeting, whether it be violin or clarinet or trumpet or flute or harmonica or whatever. Let them try and then let them learn to rejoice in praising God. Those who are good in designing and drawing, we have many ministries to incorporate those things, whether it's the magazine or producing animation stuff for children. We want to do it in an enormous way if there are people. But if people are like, eh, nothing is going to work. And I sometimes pray, Lord, surely you understand more than me. Peter, James, John, and Andrew. They were close with you. They caught thy spirit. They were leading the group all the time. They were speaking most of the time, even after you have ascended to heaven. They were there. I can feel the heartbeat of Peter when he stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached, and 3,000 were saved. 
He was a man of weakness, but there was this intensity, this earnestness and fervor within his heart. says, the Lord called me, I want to live for him. An undying passion. Surely, it's not good enough to desire that we will be right in the front and right with the right company and we'll be close to the Lord and his servants. You cannot get near physically and help hope these things will happen. Your heart must be knit with the Lord. Your heartbeat must be the beat of, heartbeat of Christ. Even in the church ministry today, I can tell you that which is most comforting, soothing, and empowering is fellow workers, fellow elders, fellow brethren who seek the Lord and know His will and stand united with me. And that's my greatest joy. If they are sitting there, me to call and say, Hello, brother, where are you today? Are you coming? How come you are late? Huh? Uh, yeah. Oh, coming, coming, coming. Okay, sure, count on me. And then come 10 hours later or two hours later. But there are people, even before I open my mouth, they are ready with things. Yes, pastor, we know it's coming and I'm ready. Don't desire the proximity, of Christ, proximity with Christ without a heart that is willing to stay focused and submissive to Christ. Don't desire a position where you seek your own comfort and prominence and not your heart surrender to Christ. These three were taken by Christ into the house of the certain ruler of the synagogue to raise his dead daughter. Other disciples were not allowed to go with him. Jesus took the three to the Transfiguration Mount. Jesus took the three in the Garden of Gethsemane just before his arrest, trial and crucifixion to pray with him. Of course, they fell asleep. Right, that's interesting, right? Chose handpicked three to pray with him, but what happened? So don't be surprised. You see Pastor Koji also falling asleep. And so pray. That's the kind of weakness we all have. But Jesus never pushed them away. He lovingly molded them. And these four, the three plus one, were closely acquainted with one another. They were one intimate team. They were on intimate terms. Today we will start looking at this group of four. Just Peter and Andrew today. That would cover our time quickly. I'm almost out of time. <laughs> All of these four, Peter, James, Sorry, Peter, Andrew, James, John. They were from the same town, Bethsaida. They were born there. We do not know exactly where Bethsaida was, but it, so, it looks like it was very near to Capernaum. Later on, we know in the scriptures that Peter and Andrew had a house in Capernaum, but they were said to be from Bethsaida. And all the four from that region, of that, which is the northern part of Galilee, and they, they were all also fishermen. All four were fishermen. They fished in Galilee Sea, or Lake Tiberias, as it was known. So they were in fishing trade. Maybe they were partners, because they knew one another. They were same place, same trade. And they were all called in a particular journey of Christ into the Galilee region. Of course, they met Christ before 
And they went back to fishing, and Jesus calls them out. And these four were the first ones who were called to follow him. And the rest were called later. So maybe all this worked together to gel them. Their background, their experience together being called from the fishing to follow Christ and to be fishers of men. And Christ's special affection toward them and training them in a special way made them a very special group of disciples. Let me speak a few things about Peter, and I think it could be quite fast for me because most of you are familiar with the story of Peter. Now, as I said, F Peter was a fisherman. Fisherman, literally a fisher. Okay, you don't expect a fisherman to be a leader of the church, do you? And that he was a leader of the apostles. In Matthew 4.18, we read... Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee and saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishes. Now, let me quickly jump into some of the strengths and weakness of Peter. They may overlap and I hope it won't trouble you much but you will take note. One of the outstanding things that I want to mention to you about Peter, which I believe was also true about Andrew, James, and John, the first four. He was a submissive person, submissive to Christ. In Matthew 4, when Jesus commanded to Peter and Andrew while they were in the fishing boat, fishing, engaging in the daily job that they should follow him. You know what they did? The scripture says they cast the boat and the net away and followed Christ. You can read that in Matthew chapter 4, uh, verse 19. Let me just read that to you. He said unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20. And they straight away left their nets and followed him. Immediate submission. And that's very necessary to be a leader in the church. You can't dilly-dally when it comes to whether or not to do what the Lord says. You must be immediately on the job no matter what sacrifice you have to make no matter what sort of difficulty you may run into you must immediately submit now what is the difficulty he was facing he was on job he had a boat he had a net of course, his father's name was Jonas. He's known as Simon Bar Jonah. Bar is son of Jonah. And we believe that it was a family business. To abandon a family business like that is very irresponsible in the sight of many. But it didn't matter. I'm always troubled by people who say, I'm called, but say, wait, Pastor, I want to serve the Lord. Or Pastor Kushi, what do you think? The Lord is impressing me. I heard the message. I get it. But, you know, my parents are getting old. I want to, you know, uh, um, help them to pay the insurance first. Uh, or another guy said, oh, I want to save up enough to give a sum to my parents. After that, I follow Jesus, I've become a preacher. There are people who have all sorts of things going on in their mind. Oh, I must do this much for these things, then I will follow Christ. Cannot be a leader. Such people cannot. In the Christian leadership, the first and foremost virtue is submission. Surrender. Not delayed obedience, but immediate obedience. 
And that was clearly seen. He was also a man of great curiosity. Now that's good, isn't it? I don't know whether you believe that. Curiosity. Well, what do I mean by curiosity? A desire to know spiritual things. He was always excited to find out what the Lord has to tell him. His curiosity got up a hand. Sometimes he said things that he shouldn't be saying. Nonetheless, we see him wanting to learn the Lord's um, will in his life. Always asking questions that are relevant in his spiritual progress. Let me just mention a couple of things at this time. He would ask questions. He would probe. He was interested in whatever the Lord is doing. He was curious. Here is one event. Matthew 16, 21 to 23. Let me read very quickly for you. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now you see, not only strength, but also weakness here. He was very inquisitive. How is that his master is going to die? And he's telling everybody that he's going to die. He thinks that it is not a good thing to be in that sort of mindset as a leader. Oh, if you're a leader, Jesus, you can't be saying you're going to die, you know, and they're going to kill you. You've got to be bold. You've got to look strong. And so he took Jesus aside. Can you imagine that? Verse 22, Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You see, he's engaging Christ. He's curious why Christ is doing it. He wants him to know how he is thinking. He's not one who keeps quiet and says, Oh, never mind. He doesn't think twice sometimes. Uh, that's uh, something we know, right? There's a saying, Curiosity kills a cat. Some people get so excited about trying to figure out things, especially when things doesn't seem to fit their thinking, they get too zealous, overzealous. Please remember, when you have such curiosity to know God's word and the truth and God's will and how things ought to be done in the church, that it will not become some sort of rashness uh, some sort of uh, misguided forwardness that borders on presumption and rebellion. I have met with a lot of young people who have lots of ideas and thinking even within the church. And, and when they come up with ideas, they talk with some sort of arrogance and as though they know more than you. Yeah, they know a little bit more how to use PowerPoint or how to use computer or that program or this program. They may know a few more technical terms than I know, but that does not make them a leader of the church. When they have these things, maybe they know music better than me. And that doesn't mean they are going to be a good choir leader or a good musician. It takes much more than that. And so if they find they can't give me an 
a word of instruction or give an elder an idea, the way they put it, you know, is trying to show forth that they know and they should, the leaders should listen to them. Instead of saying, can I ask you a question? Because I heard about this, or I think this is the way things are, then how is that you are saying this? Does it tally? If Peter would have said, Lord Jesus, I'm so troubled in my heart to hear that soon you'll be killed, and that's what you said. But Lord, then how about us? We look to you to follow. You said, follow me. And we gave up our boat, we gave up our trade, and we came out. What would people think if you get killed like that? Lord, what does it all mean? Please help me. That would be a different approach to Dan saying, come, come, I have a word for you. You shouldn't be talking like this. Make sure your curiosity concerning Christ and his ways never bring about some form of rashness in you. That proud mentality that you see in the world. You see Jesus' response to it? If you are there, you can see it quickly, isn't it? Verse 23 of Matthew 16, Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan! Wow, Jesus is so bold. Get thee behind me, Satan! Thou art an offense unto me! For this is a reason, Jesus gave him the real reason why it happened. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You are thinking like people of this world. You are not thinking what God has in plan. You are not savoring, you are not tasting God's plan and his truth. You are thinking the way the world thinks. And that is worldly, that is representative of devilish ideas. The world follows the prince of this world, or the god of this world, that's devil. And so Jesus rebuked him and said, Satan! If I were to call a fellow elder, Satan, I think you bury me next day. (laughs) No, I don't want to call that. but, But sometimes I tell you, Some of the things where the preachers or elders or deacons or somebody else say sounds exactly like from one of the pages of devil's book in the world. Exactly. And I sit there and I burn inside. Only if I have the same authority as Christ to call you Satan. Peter's impulsive disposition came out repeatedly. This is not the first time. Let me remind you another one. Soon after this, Jesus was in the upper room with the disciples. This is recorded in John 13. Now, you don't have to go there. Listen to me very quickly. Jesus wanted to wash the feet of the disciples. You remember that? What did Peter say? Again, very first to talk. Somebody said he had a mouth bigger than his foot. That could be true. Listen, John 13, verse 5 onwards. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them in the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Very bold. Jesus, let me tell you, how can you wash my feet? You are the master. I am the disciple. The master shouldn't wash the disciples' feet. That's what basically he's saying. He's He is trying to express his curiosity, but in a rash way. To this, Jesus said in verse 8, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. What a rebuke. 
Last time Jesus said, you Satan, behind me. And now Jesus says, you got no part with me, I tell you. You like this kind of scolding? <laughs> I think we need it. Simon Peter saith unto the Lord, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. You see how smart this guy is. Not only my feet, but my hands and head also. Oh, give me a shower, Lord. <laughs> Why? He wants to stick with the Lord. He cannot take the idea that Jesus is going to put him away. Because Jesus said, if you don't let me wash, I have no part with you. Then Jesus said, Peter, Peter, listen. He that is washed needeth not to save or uh, save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, if you are clean, but not all. Because Jesus knew that somebody is going to betray him. And so Jesus said, you are not all clean. What Jesus said is this, Peter, you are already washed. Only your feet is dirty because you walked in from the dusty road. Those who already had a bath, no need to have another. But now what is necessary is your feet be cleansed. But of course, as far as Judas is concerned, his whole being must be washed, even his heart, because he's going to betray. So Jesus said, you are not clean. But for you, what is necessary is to get your understanding proper now. You are okay, you love me, I know that. But you better know, you cannot have any uncleanness in you. If your feet is unclean, let me wash it. And it must be washed. Don't pretend as though you are not saved. You are saved. You are clean. But that which is sticking to you, that sin that beset you, it must be taken out. That dirt must go. Surrender. Watch your words. When I tell you this is my way with you, you just need to know. No, you see, my dear friends, he was submissive from the beginning. I told you, one of the outstanding character of Peter was his submission. Immediate obedience to Christ. However, along the way, he had to be purified further. He had to learn not to argue soon. The Lord is going to tell him, Peter, you've got to go to the Gentiles and preach. Remember the Cornelius home that he was asked to go to preach? And the night before that, the Lord gave him a dream where all the unclean animals were lowered and asked to eat. That was a sign that that which has been considered unclean will now be considered clean. And it is you, O Peter, who is chosen by me to go and preach the gospel. And he was moved first to Cornelius' home, which was a Gentile home, to turn to Christ. You know, when you become a leader, you are in the process of learning even more. And it never ends. And the submission must continue. Sometimes our forwardness in learning, in figuring out how things are, Lose, uh, make us lose sight of the bigger picture. We become too carried away by the immediate situation. We must remember our Lord is sovereign. Nothing escapes His greatness. And so, when the Lord says something that doesn't tick with our thinking, no matter how well we followed all the way, when it doesn't tick with our head, we look into the scripture and surrender to it. Scripture rules. The words of Christ rules. Our feelings cannot be relied upon. Inquisitiveness must take, play, uh, take its place. And that's a place of humility and surrender. If your hearts are not surrendered to Christ, if you allow your intellectual ability, your forwardness, your excitement to go unrestrained, it will be rebuked and sharply. And so maybe pray in our heart. There are so many other events in Peter's life that's worth studying. I'm thinking maybe next church camp we will study 
Peter's life as a camp. That's really worth studying. Not only, I'm already planning, if the Lord tarries, okay, and if I'm alive, let me not run before it. <laughs> it's my desire in the Lord, if the Lord permits. It's really fascinating to study Peter's life. But I just give you an overview. Stay submitted always. Peter had to experience this all his life. So when your cleverness, when your curiosity, when your forwardness become a little unrestrained, unwilling to stay down before the Lord, it becomes a problem. May I read with you 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter learned this lesson. 1 Peter chapter 5. <clears throat> Look at this. <clears throat> verse 8. I'm sorry. Uh, we start with verse 5. He talks about the chief shepherd Christ in verse 4. And then he says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. And be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Peter learned that. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Humbling yourself under the mighty God's hand also means being humble and submissive <clears throat> before those who are elders. <coughs> those whom God has placed above you in the church. That's why verse 5 is backed up with verse 6. Now, when you have difficulties and troubles and such situation, what do you do? Verse 7, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Submission doesn't mean you lose your opportunities. Submission doesn't mean you now lose your mind and you become brainwashed. There was one young fellow who was here. He was a very well-educated man, a medical doctor. And he has some disagreement with the doctrines that we have. At first when he joined, he said he agreed. Later he said he doesn't agree. And then he... He had a very bad attitude and he once wanted to debate me. I said this story before, so cut short. Came to my office and he, uh, I was doing something. I said, brother, give me a few minutes. So he went to my library. At that time, my library was in the church resource center. It's now moved to uh, Bible Witness Book Room. And he count, went to the section. It was on eschatology the last days. He looked at my section and he counted my books on eschatology. And I never counted it. And he came to me and said, oh, Pastor, I tell you something. I read already 40 books. I said, whoa, so many. Uh. I said, then I said, well, that's good. Praise God. But why do you mention? Because I know you also have 40 books. I said, how do you know? I just counted there. I said, I have more there. Here, some more here. <laughs> he, so funny. And then his argument is this. I want to tell you this. If we are going to debate, okay? I say, all right, no problem. But you must promise me that you will deal with me not as somebody in the pew, but who is like a pastor. Already know the stuff. So don't talk down to me, but bring me up and let's engage like two professors arguing, two experts talking. I said, do you know what you're asking for? If I treat you as a pastor and you go wrong, you get it from me. I will declare you are a false teacher. He said, no problem. I'm ready. But recently I met him. He's a nice guy. He's a lovely person, I think. I think he loves the Lord. After many years that you met him, he took my hand and said, Pastor Koshi, forgive me for my youthful nonsense. Say, you're forgiven long ago, don't worry. Are you okay? When I said that story, some of our staff asked, did you ask him to come back? 
I said, the door is always open. <laughs> Never shut. Anybody can come in. Anybody can go. He can come. He knows that. You know, I don't want to say too much about that debate. It didn't last even 10 minutes. He said, sorry, I don't understand what I'm saying. Let me go and study. And then I will send you my writing. So he sent me an email. Two big articles. The first one I read, I said, hey, he doesn't know Hebrew. He never learned Hebrew. Where did he get this? You know, I searched this article on the Google. Boom, it comes up. He just take it down from somewhere and present to me as his Second one also the same. And I call him and I said, let me tell you, what's wrong with this? Then he said, at the end of it, I think I must go back and study again. He said, good, read more books. It's not about reading books. Reading books doesn't make you a godly scholar. It is much more than reading books. It's the spirit of God that trains you all the time. It's not reading one portion of the Bible and feeling great about it. It's 66 books. Just because you mastered book of Revelation, it doesn't mean you know everything. There's so much more to learn. And I want to tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, of course, if you want to serve the Lord effectively, have a curious mind, have a heart to learn, have a heart to be of use to Christ. But keep your spirit down. Let Christ take the lead. Jesus says, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. We shall prepare our hearts for Holy Communion now. <clears throat>